Yeah. Uh, and uh, we now come to the last speaker of the session. This is Michel, who was just uh, um, um, who, who was just asking. Michel is a PhD student here from Hamburg. He has been uh, um, showing, showcasing his work uh, as a demo at previous Riot Summits, summits his, his EcoBox, and I believe he will talk about new insights he has nowadays. Michel, it's yours. Hello? You're muted, Michel. Just in this moment, he has connectivity issues. Oh. Can, can, can you see the slides already? We see the slides and we hear you. Oh, okay, that's that's uh, better, I think. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, I'm very glad that all this uh, timer stuff was already uh, brought up because I, um, uh, I I probably won't talk a lot about timers today. Um, so yeah, this talk is about uh, energy aware urban sensing with Riot. So let's uh, dive in. Um, the Agenda will look something like that. I will just quickly introduce the urban sensing um, uh, term itself, what we do in our research project on it. Um, then I, I'll show how energy neutral sensing can help with that. I'll introduce a, a system that we developed, a build for that and how we deployed it. And then I'll give a very short uh, teaser on yeah, future topics. And hopefully we'll have uh, a, at least closely interesting uh, discussion at the end. So urban sensing, yeah. I probably don't have to explain to many of you that there is a lot of data in the city that you might want to measure, collect, share, and use and whatsoever. So uh, in a city, for example, what you could do is you have some weather data uh, sensors around and you measure, uh, I don't know, whatever, uh, humidity or the weather itself in uh, in the park to know if the plants need watering. Or you might have some noise sensors that tell you that some event locations may not be adhering to uh, loudness regulations. Uh, one example that I will dive into a little bit more in this uh, talk is air pollution. Uh, it's very common in bigger cities, cities that you have air pollution sensors across uh, bigger uh, streets um, that measure if the air pollution might be unhealthy for citizens. So in the research project I'm working on, um, we uh, try to um, encourage and enable the citizens to add their own sensor to this kind of infrastructure to provide their own data to really like, yeah, participate in that. So um, yeah, they might want to add their own weather uh, sensors or air pollution sensors. So what you uh, gain from that is um, that you in signif significantly increase the sensing density across the city. So you could enable uh, new use cases like, for example, querying for your most favorite uh, running route if the air quality there is currently good or you should wait till all this, uh, I don't know, uh, cruise ships left the harbor and the air is better again, or if you maybe want to opt for a more healthy route for jogging. So uh, this is just to explain that um, sensing density in the urban areas can be an interesting topic because it enables new use cases. So one thing I want to talk about is um, how energy neutral sensing can help with that. So energy neutral sensing, what, what is that? Yeah, basically you harvest energy from the environment and you power your system from this energy that you collected. Very common is uh, solar power, for example, but you could also use uh, heat, movement, radio frequencies, whatever. Um, in this talk, we will use solar, but uh, it doesn't really matter. In the end, everything you can somehow transform into electricity, you can power a microcontroller with it. So this has the benefit that your system becomes uh, self-sufficient and uh, in best case, it doesn't require maintenance at all. So you gain something uh, that is virtual infinite lifetime. What that exactly means, maybe we can discuss later, but um, yeah, if nothing in your system breaks, you can, in theory, let it run forever. Um, for energy harvesting devices, there are um, a couple of different concepts that you may apply. Uh, the one that we are interested in is energy neutral operation, which means that um, yeah, you have uh, rechargeable batteries or supercapacitors that are big enough that you can do some proactive, rather long-term uh, energy management. So you can think ahead of, uh, uh, for example, for a day or even months, um, how you want to spend your energy. 
yeah, as uh, my uh, the, the previous talks already uh, indicated, duty cycling is very common in that case. Um, and what is um, uh, important about this kind of uh, device is that you have a continuous understanding of state. So um, what that means is that you cannot only somehow um, um, take data with uh, with you to the next uh, cycle, but you also have a continuous understanding of time. So you can schedule things ahead. Uh, another example would be uh, intermittent computing, where you uh, cannot even do that. This is pretty much out of scope for Riot right now because it's it's just too constrained. You probably wouldn't even make it to main uh, entry. So um, that's yeah, just too small for now. So now that we know we want to have some active energy management, what kind of um, um, what kind of capabilities do you really need to get energy awareness in your system? Um, the first one, I, I really liked how Benjamin uh, just said that um, you, you you shouldn't apply changes if you don't measure the effect. So this is uh, basically it's it. Moment of ambush. Excuse me. Oops, sorry. <laughs> that was my. I can help you, maybe. I mean, you're not far away. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Um, the. Um, uh, assessment is the first uh, thing you might want to do. So you measure how much uh, energy is available or you assess it somehow. You could also use uh, like properly tuned um, estimations for that. And you might want to know how much power your system is currently drawing. So once you have a good understanding of the present, you might also be interested in the future. So you start to predict like, OK, how much uh, energy will be available tomorrow and when will it be available? Uh, another topic for that is uh, if you know like the timely uh, the, the time frames when the energy will be available and how much do you need um, you might want to split up the energy consumption into different entities like who is responsible for that con kind of consumptions um, like who who uses how much energy what what kind of part in my system does that and these entities could be for example um, yeah a physical uh, sensor or also software entities like an execution step that uh, needs to be done on the device. So the, the last part to this is um, yeah basically the other way around. So you have a lot of energy uh, available or you can spare some chunk right now, but you may want to control how this is spent in your system for, for what kind of things. So now you should have a, a pretty similar understanding of um, what energy awareness means than the one I use to build a system. Uh, the Echo Box, uh, yeah, it's basically a modular uh, energy neutral sensing device, um, and it looks somewhat like that. Um, on the bottom side, you just see a, a default sensor node. It has an MCU and some peripherals we don't really care about. And on the upper side, you have a power subsystem with uh, a power source, um, a charging module, and a measurement module and an ener energy storage. What is interesting about this setup is that there is this measurement uh, module included and where it sits. Because um, like that, you can see like basically everything that goes from the power source to the energy storage and everything the MCU takes out of the energy storage um, will be uh, seen by the measurement module. So you uh, pretty pretty have a pretty nice detailed overview of uh, your energy consumption. So this is uh, the physical uh, representation of one of these modules. This is the measurement module. And the, I, I think we don't uh, have time to go into all the details. If someone is interested, we can uh, step back to that. But what is interesting is you only calibrate this thing once, and then you can attach it to whatever microcontroller. So this is really nice for researching the effects of um, uh, power consumption optimizations in field. So you just deploy it with your device. Um, yeah, same applies to the charging module. So this is also a separate module. And this module itself also supports uh, additional modularity by allowing you to connect different um, solar panels or different batteries or supercapacitors uh, as energy buffers. Speaking of supercapacitors, hmm, what is a supercapacitor? The, the beefy thing right uh, in the upper right corner, I don't know if you can you see my mouse, actually? Can you see that? Yeah, cool. OK. So. Um, yeah, uh, by accident, this thing has pretty much, I, I think, the same same measures as the thing Benjamin just showed. And um, also, the specs pretty much uh, um, match with the uh, thing I considered as a uh, comparison. So to get an understanding how much energy is stored in this thing, you need about 50 of them to get close to what is in a real smartphone. So it's a lot less than the same volume of uh, lithium battery. And 
this part also has what uh, I call like virtual infinite component lifetime, which means yeah, if you use them in regenerative braking systems or something and you really pump in power as hell, then they will eventually break. But for what we do with them, like tiny microcontrollers, it doesn't actually matter. And they are very robust against any yeah environmental factors. Any, any bad thing you might want to do to them, they won't be sad. So gluing everything together, um, you might, uh, may end up with uh, something like that. This is just all the, the modules um, uh, yeah, wired together, uh, adding a LoRa radio and a GPS module. Here you can see this nice beefy super cap with 350 farads. I still, yeah, it blows my mind. These things are awesome, really, really fun to play around with. And uh, yeah, on the upper left side, you see the main sensor of the device. So it's, um, it's a, an air, a, a particle sensor for air pollution. So it basically has a fan inside. It sucks in air and shoots a laser at the air to see if there are part, particles in there. So uh, also uh, fun to play around with. Um, of course, we want to, wanted to use this uh, setup in a mobile setting. So um, yeah, LoRa was kind of the only viable solution here. Um, if you uh, and also we need the GPS to know where this data is actually um, collected. Okay, so now you know how the hardware looks like, but what does it do? Here you can see uh, the output of the measurement module. This is uh, data that is available on the device to decide things on the energy management. So um, you can see, I think, uh, two important things in this plot. The first one is, okay, there's a lot of detail. Um, compared to just knowing, okay, it consumed that much energy, but also um, you can see that you cannot do this just with batteries because the sensor is just consuming too much power. And that's even, uh, that's a short, I mean, you can see the, the, the um, duty cycle of measuring this thing, it was like eight seconds and that is a short measurement cycle to get proper data from this um, uh, air pollution sensor, you even need to uh, leave it running for longer. Okay, so but what do we do with this detailed uh, energy information or power traces? For that, I show you this picture. On the left side, the commodity hardware part. So this is the echo principle. And the, um, on the left side, you see the commodity hardware that I just introduced. It's just like a bunch of modules glued together somehow. And on the right side, you see what happens in software. So you take the samples from the measurement module, somehow combine them with the uh, threat utilization you get from Riot. And there you go, you know how much power consumption your uh, thread has at some point in time. So this gives you a like somewhat uh, application and hardware independent um, active um, feedback on your power consumption on the system. So, okay, enough of that. Um, what did we do with the echo box? So for that, I already said that there is this um, um, air pollution thing in Hamburg going on. Um, for, there had been times where the air pollution was actually that bad that there were roads closed and as many reasonable people would agree um, if you close down roads and all the cars that needed to go this road um, now need to take an additional detour it will definitely help with the air pollution in the city so one of the better uh, ideas there was um, to buy some uh, yeah, emission-free electric buses and then we thought mm, well that's kind of interesting because now we have a mobile object moving through the city that is not itself creating emissions, um, but um, you can put something on this uh, mobile uh, device. It's, it's, it's driving through areas where, where you're interested in the uh, air pollution. So yeah, okay. So what we did is we found out where this bus lives, climbed to its roof and got overly excited and just glued our box there. I mean, okay, the people agreed, but um, yeah, since then, it's happily living on this bus and driving through Hamburg and collecting data for us. So to explain what the, the, the current state of the uh, deployment, first of all, yeah, it's still ongoing. Today is day 411 of deployment. Um, the data we collect, yeah, you can assume uh, from the sensors kind of, um, but in addition to the air pollution and uh, weather data, we also collected. Uh, speed, uh, the time it took to get GPS fixes, how many satellites were visible, and all kinds of energy statistics. Yeah, overall, this uh, thing woke up to do something uh, like a, a little bit over 1 million times, so about every 32 seconds and on average over this time period. 
um, node resets. Yeah, I mean, no no system is without failure, at least none, none, none of the ones I built. So um, the thing over all time, it, uh, yeah, the node crashed for seven times. Um, four times of that was during the first two days of deployment uh, because uh, somehow this energy management mechanism was not really fine-tuned for uh, cold starting inside of a like dark uh, garage. And yeah, we didn't have any reset uh, since January. What is important to uh, highlight here, though, is that these resets um, mean like we lost state because of power loss, for example, or some hard fault, maybe. Um, but no one needed to go there and reset it. Uh, the, no one ever touched the device since we deployed it. Yeah, the data transmitted overall uh, 4.5 megabyte. That's like not, not that much if you compare it to some other statistics, maybe. But what's even more embarrassing than that is the amount of data we received. How could that happen? Maybe we can uh, discuss a little bit about that. Uh, I have some um, good reasons for for the um, missed for the lost packets, but um, yeah, maybe we can um, talk about that later because there's a lot of content left. So what's cool from the energy perspective? Uh, it was uh, really interesting to see that even a power demanding uh, sensor like that could be powered in that way, and um, yeah, not even a laptop sized battery would have. Uh, been enough for this. So good for that. Yeah, temperatures we reached in that uh, time frame. Okay, minus eight degree. This, yeah. yeah, on average, it took about uh, yeah 10.8 seconds to get a GPS fix with this setup. Um, interesting for the uh, air pollution measurement, 70% of the daily average measurements we took were over the EU limit. Um, that basically says if you overshoot this value on uh, more than 35 days, in a year, you need to take action somehow. Um, of course, it's also important at this point to uh, highlight that this is by no means any lab equipment. It's just an indication, but it shows that it could be interesting to redo this kind of deployment with a more accurate sensor. So one of the, um, oh yeah, that's probably the most important stat, I think. So, uh, the, the bus driver hit a speed high score of 96 kilometers an hour. Um, it's pretty impressive when you see where he did that, um, but let's just assume it was an outlier or something. It's it's de definitely not his fault. So let's see. Um, yeah, lessons learned from that. So the biggest uh, thing for me was yeah, LoRa coverage. It's it's really it's hard to realistically gauge that beforehand. There there are a couple of tools to that help you with that. The TTN gateway map basically can be thrown out completely. I really don't like that. You don't get any reasonable data from that. The TTN mapper, on the other hand, is really really nice, or at least it's getting it's getting uh, way better nowadays. Um, yeah, for this case, uh, fire and forget was just not possible. You could not just deploy it and it will eventually collect data at every point you're interested in because there are just blind spots. And for these blind spots, it would have been nice to have some proactive buffering because you know your, uh, your location anyway, so you could also map that somehow to see, uh, to, to just send that data at some other location later. Yeah, and of course, the same applies to the transmission parameters. OTA updates. Uh, I don't know, someone uh, was talking about that yesterday with uh, uh, LoRaWAN, uh, that this could be a, a thing that yeah, makes sense to uh, play around with. Uh, I would definitely have liked to just do that because then I could have optimized some of the things uh, uh, right away. Yeah. Okay, GPS modules, the low power modes of GPS modules. There are some that uh, claim in their data sheets that it, they are really fancy and super sophisticated and that you can save a lot of energy by implementing some proprietary uh, commands to set them into this mode. And once you wasted all your time to do that, uh, you find out that it's a way better approach to just, just connect the MOSFET and to shut this thing down because it still consumes a lot of energy. Yeah, persistent storage in that case would also be easy. I, uh, I think in this case, it's nowadays it's just too cheap and too easy to add persistent storage so you should always do that <laughs> then you can at least correlate some of the uh, funny effects there okay <clears throat> so now i talked a little bit about our uh, deployment and the kind of energy aware uh, features that were required for that um but what yeah what to do now well, how how can we further improve i mean the yeah the uh, last recent two um talks were already indicating there's still a lot you can do and there's already a lot that works so um 
let's jump back to this image. Um, here you see the this echo principle thing that we uh, where we combine the hardware and the software somehow to uh, make sense of the power consumption at runtime. So this basically does three important things or allows you to do three important things. Not all of them very um, like uh, apply to any use case, but um, you have one variant of them. But what about the allocation that I introduced? Um, can we actually do more than duty cycling? Uh, Jürgen just said in his talk that um, you don't want to touch the TX and RX phases of your um, uh, microcontroller doing things, and you always optimize for the sleep consumption. Yep, that's true for some cases, but in some cases, there's more you can do. Let's consider this uh, example of some random application running on a very old version of Riot, where you did not have any support for low power modes. <clears throat> Basically, it always takes the same consumption, and yeah, it will stay like that as long as you supply power to it. Then some low power modes are implemented and the system can go to sleep in phases where it's not doing anything. Okay, yeah, that's um, better, definitely better. Um, then you add some better integration into the uh, drivers and for the low power modes overall and for the platform in general. Uh, and you may be able to switch to other power modes in different uh, scenarios. but. What about this huge bar in the middle? That's one of the uh, parts where uh, yeah, I think it was also uh, Jürgen who mentioned that this is a, a code section where the uh, high frequency clock is used. So you cannot go to low power mode. But what can you do? You can use dynamic voltage and frequency scaling and reduce the power consumption significantly by just reducing the uh, core clock. And that applies, yeah, of course, to scenarios where you cannot sleep and or the node is not fully utilized. But what do we require for that? Yeah, generic online clock reconfiguration. And as it turns out, it's uh, a little bit complex. Um, so what you basically do need, uh, yeah, for the, the people, I don't know if everyone knows clock trees very well. Um, I know some of you definitely do. Uh, and everyone who knows them hates them. Uh, because they are, yeah, it's it's just, it's annoying to read the data sheet to get to, to somehow squeeze out all the details of the hardware that you need to actually make sense of that and use it in the most effective way. So, um, yeah, what you what you need to actually do that, uh, you to, to, to build a generic uh, uh, module that handles this for you is that you need a lightweight uh, weight clock tree model. For all the topology and configuration, you need efficient encoding of all the properties, constraint, and so on. And you still need to somehow be able to uh, yeah, configure all that and integrate that into your system. So sounds like a little bit uh, complex. But on the other hand, um, yeah, it, en it enables you uh, to gain some significant energy savings. You can solve some problems that are otherwise hard to solve, like determining the drift at runtime in a generic way and calibrate for it. You can explore the tree, so you this you have to read the data sheet and know your MCU to do the most effective thing is not that true anymore. And you can timeshare between uh, yeah otherwise uh, conflicting configurations. So that is something I'm currently working on, and uh, the first prototype looks pretty uh, promising. You can do interesting stuff with that, and I think we should uh, continue in this that direction. I will definitely. So okay. So wrap up of the talk. Um, in general, Riot is suitable for these kinds of uh, thing uh, deployments. You still need to take action here and there and do manual stuff. Um, but uh, overall, it's the the huge impact that you get, the, the benefit from all the features that are available are much bigger than the stuff you still need to do manually to get it working. Yeah, energy neutral sensing helps to improve the sensing density, uh, higher level energy management, SOS service. Yeah, it's kind of helpful. And uh, yeah, the next thing I want to work on for that is generic online clock reconfiguration. If you want to look at some of the details here, uh, you can also look up this uh, paper. There is some of the echo things are described there. And yeah, that's about it. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Michel. Um, there has been a lot of online discussion, but first let's clap for your talk, uh, which was very nice and very fast. Um, <laughs>
So we, some of the things you have already answered. So there was a question about uh, OTA, and there was a and there is a question of uh, uh, Michael about uh, the LoRa deployment. This is actually a, a community project in uh, in all over Europe. The, the um, LoRa network. Um, oh, the TTN or uh... yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. There's a, com a European community project. Uh, I mean, he he asked on in the chat about uh, who, who I did consider the... that someone could uh, could not have heard of of it, but maybe that's just very common in our community nowadays. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry for so, that. And then uh, Nicholas asks, "Aren't you afraid the supercapacitor is going to suffer from big temperature variations on that bus?" I mean, uh, more significant temperature variations than the ones we had. Uh, the more you go down, uh, of course, yeah, they will at some point show an effect, but you will have similar effects on uh, lithium batteries. Um, and there's not really a way around it. I mean, there there are definitely supercapacitors that are a little bit more robust against that. Um, uh, yeah, but what 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 can you do if uh, the only way out is replacing it with a battery that will die from its cycles so um yeah hannes asks is there any information anywhere about the generic clock tree, clock tree reconfiguration effort you're doing <laughs> uh, okay. there there will be there will be i'm currently working on it it's pretty uh yeah pretty new stuff um i i hear someone talking i don't know if that was hello there's an echo oh it's an echo okay yeah, I was, uh, I was wondering about this because obviously this clock D configuration is really something that silicon partners typically uh, provide in all sorts of different shapes or forms uh, because they needless to know they, they or needless to say they know the hardware best and the biggest problem with this uh, making these systems energy efficient is actually reading through the data sheets to understand what these guys are doing. Yes. So I'm curious what you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I will. Uh, I, I will show that at some point. So the, the main idea behind that is that there are some uh, things that you can generalize um, that are basically the, the the main building blocks that you require to model such a tree. So you have basically some uh, gates, you have muxes, you have scalars that somehow change the frequency of the things, and the interface to these individual building blocks can be generalized and. By uh, gluing together the individual building blocks, you can actually have pretty nice control over the overall tree. That's the main idea behind it. And of course, um, this all uh, is limited by how um, small you can get all the configuration to work properly. Looking forward to it. Me too. <laughs> So oh, no open questions in the moment. So it's this is the right moment to ask a new question. Or comment. How did you detect the hard faults? The hard faults, yeah, that's um, uh, I did that with the uh, with counting uh, all the steps that I was doing on that thing and uh, combining that with the um, with the counter from the TTN. So you see, there's an increasing counter um, and a cycle counter that is uh, maintained by the node itself, by the node firmware, and uh, yeah, all of that is transmitted. So I can I can see from the um, from the cycle reset that the node failed at some point. Thanks. So there's another question. How was your network stack structured? Uh, the network stack uh, was structured in a way that is, um, I mean, it's this thing is deployed since 411 day, uh, days. I don't know who of you has some a kind of riot calendar in his head, but this was um, before merging GNRC LoRa one. So it actually uses a like, pre-alpha version of GNRC LoRa 1 with all this uh, state um, uh, context uh, saving and restore functions that were implemented back then. So Jürgen asks, are you using a watchdog? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I use some um, hardware features. So to, um, in general, the overall hardware is able to cold start from any situation. So if anything breaks, it should at some point go back to working state. 
Um, I don't use any software uh, watchdog. What I actually do is that, <laughs> I don't know if I should say that, but um, the, I, I, I misuse the RTC for that um, in, in some cases. So that if the execution gets stuck, there is definitely an interrupt to happen. Okay, there's another question uh, uh, from Ivan. Uh, he asks, uh, uh, from your power consumption point of view, what is the best practice to send the data? Send when available or buffer locally and send as bulk? <laughs> um, yeah, interesting question. Um, I had the luxury uh, situation that I didn't need to think about that because um, the bandwidth was or, uh, was actually the the limit, so I would have had a lot more energy to send more data if I could use uh, or misuse the LoRa stack. Um, but I wanted to somehow adhere to the airtime regulations. So, um, in theory, it's of course it, it very much depends on how much detail you want to want to have from your data. So uh, it always makes sense that if you co can combine it, just aggregate it and send it later. But if you want to have your data in time, it doesn't really help you if you aggregate that for two days. Um, Hannes asks about, have you thought about switching to cellular? <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I, I thought about also using that, but I kind of like the um, uh, the opportunities with uh, Laura one that you can, I, I mean, first of all, it's for hobbyists, it's, it's very cheap to do that. You don't need any SIM cards. Uh, the the instantaneous consumption of cellular uh, things can be quite high. Um, that in in some cases that can uh, already be a blocker. Um, and the the bandwidth limitation that I um, had is actually only related to the fact that I wanted to send out a really huge amount of uh, debug information on the energy management itself uh, to see what's going on there and. Um, I, I wouldn't do that in if my only goal was to measure air pollution, then I could easily use LoRa with uh, smaller packets. Okay, so no more open questions here. Then I guess we are just in time. We can conclude this really interesting and lively session. So I thank you all, particularly the speakers, but also all those who brought up questions and debates. And I hope you will. Uh, Continue some of the discussions uh, in the in the meeting room in uh, in the in the break now. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye.